Hello, church. This is Frank, and um, hey, you hanging in there? I hope so. Um, I'm looking forward to worship today. I thought we'd start off with a prayer song, and um, and even before that, start off with scripture. Um, hey, I just want you to know that now's the time that uh, that we pause. This is the Lord's day, so we stop. And um, the people that you're with just understand that these these days are going to get weary. And we're going to get strength from the Lord. And uh, by not playing a game, not playing religion or pretending like we're in worship in our living room, but meeting together and seeking Him. And I want to read Psalm 46. If you want to, uh, I'll give you a second. If you want to open your Bibles to Psalm one to Psalm 46. Is that what it is? And then, um, uh, and then it'll be on the screen too if you want to just read along. But, um, um let it be something in your soul that cries out uh, that we need the Lord's help and uh, he's going to give it, okay? Psalm 46, in verse 1 it says this, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way and though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea and though its waters roar and foam and though the mountains tremble as it's swelling, at its swelling, for there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, and he utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Uh, would you pray this prayer song with me? Just ask if the Lord's help. You know it. Sing it with me. So Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart So Lord I need you Oh I need you Lord Every hour I need you My one defense my righteousness oh God how I need cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. I can't sing. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. 
there. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Glad you found us online. I hope that in these next few moments that you will encounter God in worship. You will hear from God through the word and you will gather the people, whomever they are around you, and you would um, be together and uh, enjoy his presence. Just a couple of quick church family announcements. Normally, uh, people, uh, we pass an offering plate and stuff in our worship services. Obviously, we're not going to do that. We want to encourage you to go to our website, heritagepark.org. In the upper right corner, there's a link uh, that uh, you can put, uh, you can click, and it says um, give, and you can give online. You can set up automatic uh, giving even by doing that, and uh, that way you don't even have to worry about it. We want to encourage you with that. Um, also, wanted to let you know that um, it looks like we're going to set a um, church conference for next Wednesday. Uh, we are taking some steps uh, to take advantage of the uh, payroll protection program. And so that will require a church conference for us. Yes, it will be virtual. We will be getting details out about that, but just put it on, on your uh, radar that next Wednesday is going to be that time. I hope everybody's having a great time. Kids, I hope you sing loud. I hope you sing so loud and enjoy this time together. We're glad that you're here. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought their donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee.
Heritage Park Church family. My name is Paige Wells and I am the director of His Kids, the weekday preschool ministry of Heritage Park. We pause at this point in the service to pray for our one. Our one is someone who doesn't know the Lord or is far from God. So let's take a minute and pray for our one together. Dear Heavenly Father, in this time of uncertainty, we thank you that we can trust that you are in control. Lord, we know that none of this took you by surprise. We're trusting your goodness and your character and your love for us, Father. As we lift up our one to you, Father, we pray that you would show us new and creative ways to be able to connect with that person. God, we're not able to meet face to face, but that you will show us opportunities that we can use to speak your name to them and how we can pray for them and their family. God, that you will give us the insight and the wisdom to know how we can help them take their next step and what our next step should be. We thank you for the privilege of serving you this way and we pray that your kingdom will be glorified because we have been obedient. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Yeah. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given the name. My feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began. There you go. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner. My shame was a ransom, you faithfully bore. You canceled my debt and you called me a friend. When death was arrested, in my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes. 
Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices though heaven lost. But then Jesus arose and I'm free to be. Welcome to the sermon portion of this. I'm glad again that you have joined us. Let's take a moment and we will pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we ask that you would help us in these moments um, to think about what is true and what is right and what is honorable, what is good, what is just, what is precious to you and good for us. Um, there is a lot, a lot of things in the world that are uh, calling for our attention. They are begging for it, uh, demanding it even. Help us now to be focused on you, what you say. We want to hear from you. So would you open our ears and open our hearts to hear from you? We don't want to be the same people. We want to be transformed by your grace. Would you make that our reality now in Jesus' name? Amen. Well, we're glad you're here today. Thanks again. And uh, we're going to be reading from the uh, second letter to the Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 to 20. You got a Bible or an app you want to open? Please feel free to do so. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. And here is Modine Mills to read that for us. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, I wanted to have a minute uh, and think with us uh, this morning about who God has called us to be and how he is uh, moving us and shaping us. It's, if it seems like these, same, uh, these sermons have been the same over and over and over again, they have in some sense because we are a family of missionaries. So we've been focused on this identity while also thinking about the implications of that. Now, our whole lives are Groundhog Day. We do wake up and do the same thing over and over again. So just, it just seems right that the sermons should focus on this same theme and push us to thinking about who God has made us to be and how we walk into this. So um, we, I, we've said this before, I want to say it again, we embrace this identity that we are a family of missionaries who live to do three things, pursue God, 
to love well and serve the world. That is who he has called us to be as a church family. Our identity is that, and the ministry that we get to do flows from that. And then last week we talked about how important it was to leave the results to God. And so I want to encourage us today with this last sermon uh, from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, talking about who we are as ambassadors for Christ. In this text, I think Paul highlights that he gives us two, that God has given us two amazing, amazing gifts. And on this Palm Sunday, as we move into Easter week, I thought it'd be perfect for us to highlight these two gifts. So here we are. Gift number one is the gift of reconciliation. I want to read it again. Verse 18. All this is from God, who who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So I want to talk about this sense of reconciliation. I want to note a couple things. First of all, it is initiated by God. So it says back in verse 18, all this is from God. If you ever think... Um, uh, or wonder where this process came from, how this process came to be, know that it came deep in the heart of God. It came from deep in the heart of God who burns with a passion for reconciliation with you. The word here that Paul uses is not a matter of two warring parties kind of coming to peace as much as it is God in this particular instance pursuing us. Now just think about that incredible grace because here we have the parties are the offended and the offender and we are the offenders and yet God the offended pursues us, chooses to move toward us, Um, makes a a way for us to be reconciled to him. It is initiated by God. And so I just want to celebrate that fact that you and I are people who have been pursued by God. All this is from God. When we are reconciled, we are reconciled to God. We don't reconcile ourselves to God. We are reconciled to God. The second thing that's worth highlighting here, in addition to that incredible grace, is that it was accomplished not by us, Not by our works, not by our good deeds, not by our attitudes, not even by our faith, but instead it was accomplished by Christ. So he says this again twice, 18 and 19, verses 18 and 19 are uh, kind of a statement and then a restatement uh, about this. So he says it twice in these two two, uh, verses. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And then down in verse 19, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. So this was accomplished by Jesus for us. We didn't do it. He did it for us. Now, the most famous verse in 2 Corinthians is in this passage down in verse 21. And so the question becomes, how did he do this in Christ? Well, glad you asked. It's down in verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin so that we who knew no sin... um, I, sorry, I messed that up. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God made Jesus to become sin for you and for me. He didn't know sin before, but God made him to become sin so that you and I, who didn't know righteousness before, would become righteous. Now, that's really important, a great concept to, to latch onto, because so much of our lives is spent weighing the scales. If I do this, what will the outcome be? If I put this uh, here, what will the, the difference be? How will it change? What will the delta be? And so I just want to encourage you to think about your spiritual life in those terms, which we're already used to. Here they are. You and I have such an offense toward God that we can never make ourselves right. We can never even the scales. So what happens? The Bible says in verse 21 there that God takes that sin from us and puts it on Jesus. That is an amazing thing for us to think about, a profound thing for you and I to think about. He takes our sin and he puts it on Jesus. So that would be enough to even the scales there. But more than that, what does he say? He gives the righteousness of Jesus to you and to me. So now the scales are tipped in our favor. Not only is our debt 
paid for, which is great. But also, um, it, is, it is more than that. It is a, a reconciliation. If it is a ma- being made right with God. You and I are given the righteousness of God. Not only uh, is our debt paid for, but also we are made right. Unbelievable. What incredible, incredible grace. So I, I want to say that he is... Uh, It is accomplished. All of this is accomplished uh, by Jesus. There is a verdict that has been rendered and the relational blessings that come as a result of that are now ours. Initiated by God and accomplished in Christ. And lastly, I want to just point out that this is experienced by us. And so I just back it up here um, to uh, verse 18 again. All this. Now, what is all this that he's talking about? Look back in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. So that, that's not so much um, thinking about their bodies, their skin, although it certainly includes that. It's a, it's a measure of worldly standards. And so um, when we say this, it's something like from now on, we don't recognize people according to the ways that the world recognizes people. Yes, maybe according to the color of their skin or their ability to do something or inability to do something, but it's bigger than that. It's just measuring people by worldly standards. Um, even though once we regarded Christ uh, in this way, so according to the flesh. So we regarded Jesus um, as somebody who, uh, um, you know, didn't do the things that he said or, or uh, Paul in particular has in his mind here. He was um, hostile to God. And so he was regarding Jesus according to, um, according to the worldly standards. Um, and then in verse 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. So not only all this is from God. Remember, and it's experience. We don't regard people according to the flesh. We instead um, are made a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Think about that. All the things uh, that are in your past are in your past. Jesus has made them old. He has made them go away. This is particularly um, powerful for Paul to give this testimony. Why? Because he regarded Christ according to worldly standards. And then what happened? On the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he was knocked off of his horse by a blinding light. And in that moment, Jesus revealed himself to Paul. And so what would Paul say? Man, the old has gone away and the new has come. That's true. And then further, we are not only made new, not only are we not judged according to the worldly standards, and not only are we also made new, but also we are reconciled. Our relationship is reconciled to God, by God. So there's incredible security in that. We, the people of God, are the kinds of people that God has pursued. We have we have been made right with him and the security that comes with that because I didn't make it make myself right with God because he did it. Therefore, I can count on it to stay. If it were dependent upon me, it would have already gone away, but it's not. It's dependent upon God. We are made right with God. And then he explains that further in verse 19, that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's trespasses, the world's trespasses against them. So you and I are experiencing forgiveness when we uh, sin against God, when we make choices that are antithetical to what he says are the opposite of things that he says are right to do, or we don't do the things that we are supposed to do. There is forgiveness for us, and that forgiveness is sealed and accomplished by Jesus, but experienced by us. And then lastly, and he says he's entrusted us with a message of reconciliation. So he fills our lives with purpose. So we go to work uh, when we get to go to work or we log on, um, which is most of our experience these days, and our lives are packed with purpose, even though it seems like, man, we're really struggling in these days um, to find our purpose or express it. Our lives are still filled with purpose because God has entrusted us with this incredible message of reconciliation. He says down now in verse um, 20, and this will transition us to the second gift. He says, therefore, Therefore, now that's really important uh, because everything that he's about to say is predicated upon what he has said before. So this is critical for us um, to wrap our minds around. You and I need to be people who embrace the idea that we have received the gift of reconciliation. Those who then have been entrusted must be engaged. Can you imagine having a cure to the coronavirus and not saying anything about it, not, not being engaged with that process? That would be 
that would be not just wrong, it would be ridiculous. So for us, we who have been entrusted with this message of reconciliation must be engaged. And there's a very, very practical application for us as a church right now. Most of you know, we are talking about planting a church in 2021. And so now is the time where it's a great opportunity for us to begin to pray and think about and reflect on how we might engage. And I'll give you four ways that we can engage. And it's such an important thing that I put this in the middle of the sermon. So uh, here's one way to pray is to be a prayer partner. You commit on a regular basis to connect with that church plant and, and, and its uh, leadership, Kyle and Casey and the others, and how you can pray. Secondly, you can also be someone who gives um, financially to that church plant. A third way that you could be involved is to be, uh, to be a serving partner. Maybe you're a prayer partner, maybe you're a giving partner, maybe you're a serving partner who um, gives there in some way. We don't know all the ways that service will be needed in that moment but, um, or when that plant comes, but we know that there will be some. But also from the Heritage Park side, those who go, we will need people to step up and backfill all these positions that would potentially be left. And so to step up into service, you could be a service partner. And lastly, you could be a going partner, somebody who goes with them to plant that church. So we who have been entrusted must be engaged. And we want every person in our church family to pray about their role in the church plant as it gets closer uh, in 2021. And that leads us to the second gift, back to verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. <laughs> what an incredible thing. We are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. That means we are a people who carry a certain amount of authority, but also responsibility. We are commissioned servants, um, envoys, if you will, of God who carry that, his authority, but also we have a responsibility to step out. And so I want to talk about the two ways that we express that. First is the message of ambassadors. What, it, what is the message of, of an ambassador? Uh, an ambassador is a diplomatic um, uh, messenger or envoy um, on behalf of someone to, to go and make peace. That's kind of the way that um, Paul uses that word. He picks it up from diplomatic language in ancient Rome. And so uh, we want to be those kinds of people who are announcing the peace of God um, to the world. God sent, he, he's done this before, he has sent prophets and he has sent apostles. And now you and I, we are the ambassadors um, for God. We, we are the ones who have been sent into the world. Whenever we have been entrusted, we must be engaged. And so we are sent um, into the world. We are sent with God's words. Now, many of you have had this experience, I know, already around here where uh, you need to communicate to some, uh, one of your kids, but that kid is on the other side of the house or upstairs. And so you say to the one closest, hey, go tell them that I said this. And it's time to come down for dinner or whatever. So up the stairs, they run to the other part and uh, they come back. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, you know, he's not doing anything. She's not doing anything. And then you say, no, wait a minute. Dad said or mom said, well, that gives them a certain amount of authority. So they walk in there. Their chest is puffed up a little bit and they say it with authority. Now, mom said it is time to come down for dinner. Well, there's a, a, a weight, if you will, behind that message. So it is. Um, with us. You and I have been sent into the world, not with a mom said or a dad said, but with a God said. God has said, and we can stand and speak with authority about the things that God has said. Why? Because we know that they are true. It is the message uh, of the ambassador. What, what, what then do we say? What is our particular message? Well, it is that you don't have to be judged by the world's standards anymore. You can be a new creation in there in verse 17. All the things that are old about you, your old ways, your old habits, the old addictions, you can experience freedom. Why? Because everything has become new. Um, you can be the kind of person who has been reconciled to God. You can be the kind of person who is made right in their relationship with God. You can be the kind of person, I've got a dog barking upstairs, that's what's going on. And so you can be the kind of person uh, who now is uh, experiencing the forgiveness of God. And you can be the kind of person who, uh, but because uh, of his work in your life, has a life that is filled with purpose. And so... That's the message that we stand and say. We can stand and say to anyone, God will forgive you. Why? Not because of we, what we've said, but because of what God has promised to them. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, 
He says, if we confess with um, our sins to God, that he will be faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can stand and we can say that with authority. Why? Because it is what God has said. That is our message. We, that is the message that ambassadors carry. But secondly, what then is the activity or the work of God's ambassadors? I just want to point here to a couple of things. That we act with a certain amount of, of authority. That we not only speak with authority, but we act with a certain amount of authority. What does that look like? It just looks like that what God has said is going to be true. And so I want to encourage you um, to live and act like what God has said is going to be true. Will he be with us? Yes. Will he encourage us? Yes. Will he um, have a, uh, uh, excuse me, will he never forsake us? Yes. Will his love ever fail us? No. Those are the kinds of things that we can act on and we can live with that kind of authority. Here in particular, it says that we have been entrusted at the end of verse uh, at the end of verse uh, 19, we have been entrusted with the gospel, with this message of reconciliation. God has entrusted us. He has given us his authority. Second thing, that we stand in the place of God. So back down here in verse 20, we implore you um, uh, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The phrase before that, God is making his appeal through us. Last week, we talked about being God's fellow workers. Here it is again. We are a people being used by God to send this message out. He has commissioned us as a family of ambassadors to carry this message, and we are standing in his place. We are make, God is making his appeal through us. We're standing there, and God is the one who is speaking through us. So Act with authority, stand there in God's place. And lastly, we would work to secure God's interest. That's the message, uh, excuse me, that's the activity of an ambassador is to, um, uh, is to act with authority, is to stand in God's place, and is to secure God's interest. And I just want to read down a couple more verses starting in chapter 6. Look at verse 1. Working together with him, there it is again, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listen to you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Think about that. Think about that. What are we working for? We are working to secure God's interest. And what is, what is it in particular? He says that the people that we are ministering to would not um, uh, receive God's grace in vain. They wouldn't hear about this message and then turn away. We would work um, so that it is the most appealing thing for them to understand and to embrace. And so you and I are working to secure God's interest. The, the, the people that we're ministering to would not receive the grace of God in vain. Now, I, I, I want to close w- with this simply, that um, some of you are out there and you may need to be reconciled with God. Maybe you've been far, far away from God and this um, virus has got you thinking long and hard about what it looks like Um, to uh, be a person who faces their mortality or who faces unknown things or who faces things that they can't control. The greatest thing that you could do today is not receive God's grace in vain, but let it into your life and and surrender your life to him. Um, Maybe you uh, have been away from church for a while and you're just tuning in. I just want to encourage you, don't receive God's grace. Don't be the kind of person who hears this message and then just walks away the same. Don't, Don't be like that. Open your life to him. Some of you are here and uh, listening right now and you've never received God's grace. You don't even know what that means. Here's what I would say to you, that Jesus is the one who has pursued us. We don't have to wake up and pursue him. He is the one who has pursued us. He is the one who has made a way for us to be reconciled to God. And I want to encourage you today, if you will surrender your life to him. Um, you too can be reconciled to God. That's what it says in chapter 6, verse 2. Today is the day of salvation. So I want to encourage you with that, that you think about that, that you um, pray about that, that even in a moment uh, uh, when we are uh, uh, done praying, that you would crack your laptop open and you would send an email to me. It's trent at heritagepark.org. If you have questions about what it means to be reconciled to God, I would love to have that conversation with you, albeit virtually. I would still love to have that conversation with you. If you're distant from God, if you're disconnected from God, if you've never connected with God, I want to encourage you to receive God's grace today by surrendering your life to him and putting your faith in Jesus. So let me pray for all of us as a church family and those who are listening, and then we'll um, move on to us all. Father, I ask you now um, that as you have spoken, 
God, that you would do, um, you would do in their lives what they need, whatever it is. I pray, Father, that you would move in their hearts. I pray, Father, that you would um, uh, demonstrate and show yourself to them. You would show yourself to them in ways that um, would surprise them, and even catch them off guard in order to catch their attention. I pray, God, for anybody who is distant from you, anybody who's disconnected from you. Uh, I pray, Father, that today would be the day that they receive the grace of God and be reconciled to you. And I pray, God, for all of us who um, claim Heritage Park as our church family, that we would be people who live and embrace this idea of that we are a family of ambassadors. We are people who are sent into the world with this incredible message, and we would act accordingly. And I ask all of this, Father, for the sake of the kingdom and in Jesus' name. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the tears stand blessed for a world of lost sin. cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some Exchange it to me for her.
Thanks again for joining us today. So grateful that you made the time to worship and to hear from God's word together. Um, I pray that wherever we get to go this week, that we would go um, like what we have said and what we have sung is true. That we would go as a family of ambassadors and live like Jesus reigns over everything. Have a fantastic week, everyone. What you did for me, oh, like you love. What you did for me, yeah. What you did for me, for a crown. Yeah. So I cherish the Oregon cause. I'm